All right. So we are in week three, third week back uh, after our summer break. Week one, we were in 2 Peter 1, I think, verse 2, uh, and just talking about how grace and peace are multiplied um, within the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And 30-second overview, basically, grace, God's turning towards us, and peace, that wholeness in our life, are multiplied within us. They grow within us as we get to know who Jesus actually is. Not like cold, hard facts, but as we get firsthand experiential, very accurate and precise knowledge of who Jesus is, that grace and that peace in our life uh, begin to multiply. And then week two, which was last week, we basically just went one verse down and went through 2 Peter 1, I think verse 3, and talked about how everything we need for both life our life in Christ, and then godliness have been granted to us through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so really everything that you need for your life in Christ is found in understanding and knowing who Jesus really is. And so tonight we're just going one verse down. We're going to be in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. I'm going to read through it, and then we'll dive in from there. So I'm going to start in uh, verse 3 first and just recap that. His divine power has granted us everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. And then verse 4, Through these He has given us His precious and magnificent promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature now that you have escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. And so what I want to focus mainly on tonight is the fact that through the promises of God, we actually get to partake, become a sharer in the very divine nature, the nature of God. And if we want to see... <laughs> who we naturally are versus who God is and what our nature is versus what God's nature is. We can go over to Galatians 5 um, in verse 19. Uh, and so this is basically me and you apart from the divine nature, just like really uh, exposed. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, discord, jealousy, rage, rivalries, divisions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Which Paul is basically just like, and just everything else that's not super good, right? Um, so that doesn't mean that everybody's out getting hammered every night or that everybody's having orgies, right? But it's saying the acts of who we are in our nature are in this. It might just be divisions. You're envious of your neighbor because you want what they have and you can't have it. And you think, man, if I had that bigger house or if I got the pool like they would, that would be the thing that made me happy or their wife looks better than mine. And if I had that, you know, if I had that person, that would be the thing that made me happy. Um, rage, that anger that rises up in you to where you just want to like, punch people in the throat for no really good reason sometimes, right? Anybody ever been there where you're just like, I'm just, ang everybody annoys me today and I have no idea why. They're just breathing loudly, right? Um, discord, you just don't get along with people, right? Like there's, you hate this person, they hate you. Uh, there's drama at work and people aren't getting along. Like all of that stuff we live with pretty much every day, right? And if we're being honest, it's in the church just as bad as it is anywhere else, right? Like people gossiping about people, people mad at people and everything else because we're human. And like we are being transformed from glory to glory into the image of Jesus Christ, but we're really not there yet. And so a lot of, uh, a lot of this, if we're being honest, still is very alive and very well in our lives, whether we'd like to admit it or not. And so that's what lives in us naturally 
apart from the Holy Spirit and the divine nature being inside of us. That is us, right? Like some people are probably naturally nicer because of the environment they were raised in or just their temperament. Some people are naturally more aggressive, whatever else. But still, this is our natural inclination. And sometimes you've met those really seemingly nice people and then they'll like slit your throat and you don't, you're like, that came out of nowhere, right? And so like even really seemingly tender and gentle people apart from the divine nature being inside of us through the Holy Spirit, like we're still that. Like that is us at the end of the day. But if you go down to verse 22 in Galatians 5, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, I don't know about you, but those don't really come naturally to me, right? Like, if you were probably to describe your workplace uh, or describe other places in the world and just what you interact with each day, I doubt many people would describe it as loving, joyful, peaceful, a lot of patience everywhere I go. There's a lot of kindness, a lot of goodness, a lot of faithfulness, a lot of people just being really gentle, and everybody's very self-controlled. It's probably not what we experience most of the time. And so that's kind of the, the difference in our nature and who we naturally are, and then God's nature and who he is. And you can even go over, if you wanted to, you go to 1 Corinthians, I think it's 10, or 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, that's quoted basically at every marriage, like every wedding you've ever been to. But that, you know, love is patient, love is kind, doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, and that God is love, so those are actually describing characteristics of who God is. But that's the divine nature in a nutshell. In contrast to our nature, it's very, 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 very different. And it's not something that ever just like comes naturally to us in this world apart from God. And so that's our nature versus the divine nature. And I want to go back to 2 Peter uh, 1.4. And it says, through which he has given us his precious and magnificent promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. And so there seems to be a lot of significance around the promises of God in Scripture and what they actually mean and do for our lives. Because it says, through them you may become a partaker, you share in literally the divine nature, the nature of who God is. You get to share in that in such a way that you're transformed. And what we read about in Galatians 5 the acts of the flesh would start to disappear in your life in favor of the fruit of the Spirit starting to appear in your life through these precious and magnificent promises. And so it seems pretty significant to what these promises actually do in our life. And there's a whole lot of promises in Scripture. I don't by any means know all of them to any degree. Um, but there were a couple and one main one that I really wanted to focus on tonight. And the first one is um, just the promise of the Holy Spirit himself. This was promised several times, multiple times in the Old Testament. Um, one time's in Ezekiel 36, and it says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Verse 27, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and to carefully observe my ordinances. And so that's Old Testament. That was Ezekiel. He was a prophet in the Old Testament. And that was a prophecy about what would happen when Jesus came, died, and rose again. And then the Holy Spirit fell at Pentecost in Acts. And you see in Ephesians 1, verse 13, it says, and in him, having heard and believed the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the pledge of our inheritance until the redemption 
of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. And then because we have the Holy Spirit within us, like just for a second, think about that. So the same spirit that was in the Apostle Paul that wrote basically almost all the New Testament, the same spirit that was in Peter while he was getting stoned to death and he was asking that their sins may not be held against him as they were hurling insults at him and literally killing him. The same spirit that empowered him to do that, for those of us that have put our faith in Christ, that spirit is within us. So like, every time you go to read the Bible as a believer, as somebody who's put their faith in Christ, the spirit of God that inspired people to wrote the Bible, that inspired people to write the Bible, that same spirit that inspired them to write it lives in you. That's why you see like Jordan on a Sunday morning sometimes, he reads a scripture and then talks about it for like 40 minutes and then you're like, I've never gotten that out of that before, right? Like you're like, sometimes you're like, well, I've read that book of the Bible multiple times. I didn't even know that scripture was in, in that part of the Bible, right? But he's dwelled on it for so long and the spirit of God that wrote it lives in him and is able to bring out the depths of what that really means. Like imagine if you had the spirit of somebody else living inside of you to tell you the real motive behind everything they ever did, right? Like if, say for sake of argument, your wife's spirit was in you and she could actually explain to you what she meant by the stuff she said. You know what I mean? Like that'd probably be a different world, right? But if she was like, hey, when I said this, her spirit was in you, it's like, this is what I meant. Most of us would probably have a way different marriage, right? Because sometimes you're like, you told me it was fine and I did it, but now I'm very understanding it was not fine. That was not one of the fines, it was a good fine, right? Um, but like the spirit of the God of the universe dwells within us. Like, that's significant. But the old you also still lives in you. And uh, if you're like me at all, you can encounter the presence of the Lord and be on fire one day, and then you wake up, and it's like your flesh is very alive and well the next day. And you're like, well, where was the, where was the Lord that I felt so strong, you know, last night in communion, and now I'm just cold this morning? Right? Like, we have this, scripture talks about this war within us between the spirit and the flesh. And so we have the spirit of the living God in us, but we also have the flesh that's still alive in us. And so scripture's saying that through the promises of God and scripture, like we can partake of the divine nature, which means me and you don't have to live as lustful, grumpy, hateful people. Like, we don't have to live that way, right? You're probably not gonna wake up tomorrow and just be totally changed, but it will be gradual over time, but like, you don't have to live that way. You don't have to live angry at every person in your life all the time for the rest of your life. And newsflash, they're not the problem, right? Like, every time you're really mad at everybody, odds are they haven't done a whole lot. Right, you're just grumpy. You probably need a good meal, a good nap, and some time with the Lord. And you're like, wow, these people actually aren't that bad. All right, when you get tired and hungry and haven't spent time with the Lord, everybody's annoying. Let's just be honest, okay? I work at a church, it's full time ministry, that's what I do with my life. And sometimes you come in, I'm just like, people are just getting on my nerves. And I'm like, Scott, this is you, this isn't them. You just, you need to go. When Elijah was hungry, or when he was tired and afraid and wanted to die, the Lord's like, listen, I'll send an angel, they're gonna give you some food, and then you're gonna take a nap, and then after that, you can go meet with me, and then you'll be refreshed, all right? So maybe sometimes we just need a good nap, some food, and uh, if your wife's on the women's retreat, you get that this week, right? You can take a nap and eat some food. But we don't have to live that way, like, it's our natural, it's what's easiest, it's what's most comfortable because that's what we've grown up in. That's all you really know. I think that's kind of the tricky part sometimes is you've only ever known your own nature, 
So to partake of the divine nature is a very foreign thing. And as human beings, we tend to gravitate to what's most normal and what's most comfortable. And so it can be odd and unfamiliar. And I think sometimes we even think that like our dysfunction is just the way God made us. Like God just made me a hard person. He just made me kind of rough. That's just the way I am. Um, or I'm just overly emotional all the time. And like, that's just who I am as a person. Well, maybe so, but that's not how the spirit of God is. And if we're supposed to be transformed into his image, that's not the way we're supposed to live the rest of our lives either. And so that's not the position that God wants you to stay in. It's okay if you're there, he'll happily work with you for the rest of your life, even if you're grumpy for the next 20 years, right? Like God's loving and he's patient and he's kind, just like Jordan talked about on Sunday. But don't get to thinking that your dysfunction is the way that you were designed. It's a result of living in a fallen and a broken world. And we have to have our minds renewed. And so I want to go into um, one kind of specific promise. And it's out of James 4. And it says, um, it's James 4, 8. I'll probably read a little bit more of it here in just a minute. But it says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So that's a promise in scripture, which means by following this promise, we are doing something that will allow us to begin to partake of the divine nature. And I just want to read the divine nature again, just so we know fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace. I don't know about you, but that sounds like some nice things to have in overflow in my life. Love, joy, peace, right? Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And so this is one of a ton of promises in Scripture, but just think about this one, that if you actively start to draw near to the Lord, He says, I'll draw near to you. Right? Like, has anybody, if you spent more time with somebody, you start to know them better, and you can start to almost predict the, the way they would respond in a certain situation, right? Like, if you've worked with your boss long enough, you can pretty much answer for your boss, right? Like if you worked with them for a decade or something, you pretty much know what their response to be, would be to most given situations. And so as you draw near to God and he draws near to you and you get to spend time with him, encounter his presence, you get to partake, become a sharer in his nature instead of your own nature. And these things gradually over time for the rest of your life will start to become apparent. You'll have a love, I think, within you that you're very, very keenly aware isn't you. Like you'll just start to experience, it might be your wife or your kids all of a sudden, or it may be some random homeless dude at a gas station. And it's like all of a sudden you feel this love, this compassion, and you're like, this isn't me. But you're aware of it. You've drawn near to God. He started to draw near to you. And you're, you're starting just a little bit to truly become a partaker of the divine nature. That's very different than reading the fruits of the Spirit, not drawing, God, drawing near to God, but trying to do them yourself. Like, I'm just going to try to have love, joy, peace, and patience, but I'm not really about drawing near the Lord. Like, I want to try to get the stuff that He has without actually getting him, it's probably not going to pan out too well, right? You can kind of fake it for a little while. Anybody ever just tried to be fake nice for just like a certain period of time, and then all of a sudden you just blow up because you're like, this is so exhausting, right? Like, you know, you met those people too that like they're super nice at work, and they get home and you're like, you know, they probably beat the dog and maybe their kids, right? <laughs> maybe you've been that person. I don't know. I'm not judging anybody, right? But like, you can only, you can like fake the fruits of the Spirit for a little bit, but it comes out in an overflow of the negative on the back end. You know what I mean? So through that promise, you can see, okay, this is something from God. He says, if I draw near to him, 
he'll draw near to me. And by doing that, just one of these promises, I can start to actually become a partaker in his nature, which is very different than just trying to change your old nature, right? Like change your old nature is kind of like trying to polish a turd, just doesn't pan out too well. But when you actually get a new nature, it's not about trying to grit your teeth and do better. It's like you experience a love and a joy and a peace that you're like, this isn't me, but it's there. Like I feel it. I can tell like something's different in me and I'm not forcing it. It's a byproduct of obeying the promise, essentially. And so he says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And I want to go up and kind of read uh, a little bit more of James 4 and then jump into one other spot. And then I believe we'll be closed down after that and we can go into discussion time. And so... Um, James chapter 4, the headline of this one is a warning against pride. Uh, so he says, what causes conflicts and quarrels among you? Acts of the flesh. Don't they come from the passions at war within you? You crave what you do not have. You kill and covet, but are unable to obtain it. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask. And you do not ask or when you do ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may squander it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever chooses to be a friend of the world renders himself an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to dwell in us yearns with envy? But... He gives more grace. That is why it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And there's verse 8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, weep. Turn your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before God and he will exalt you. And so in the first part of James chapter 4, uh, he's basically just like breaking down the acts of the flesh that they're kind of living in. And then in verse 6, in spite of this, in spite of the way you're acting, you're quarreling, you're fighting, you don't have because you don't ask, and then when you do ask, you're asking just for yourself, and so you're probably not going to get it. And then in verse 6, he says, but he, God, gives us more grace. That is why it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And I think only recent, recently in my life, I've started to, I think, read things a little bit differently in Scripture in the sense that God only wrote it because he wants that relationship with me. And so he's saying, I want you to know that in your pride and your arrogance and your selfish ambition, I am by nature opposed to that. That is the opposite of who God is. He says, so he's, he wants you to know I oppose that way of life, but I give grace to the humble. And that grace, if you were here three weeks ago or two weeks ago, week one, that grace is like God turning, that God turning towards us to share benefit. And so I looked at, like I read it in the sense of like, God put that in there because he wants you to understand the way of life to where he can pour himself out on you in a fresh way. Not as like a condemning judgment, but as an opportunity to experience more of his presence. And so he's saying, even in this way of life, he still gives more grace. And part of that grace is right now in this moment, he's saying, in your pride, I'm opposed to that. But man, if you humble yourself, I can dump grace on you like a river. And he's, he's wanting you to know that opportunity of like, you know, if your child's disobeying, you're like, if you do this, you will get a spanking. 
But what I'd rather do is have you come over here on the couch and I can give you like the biggest pop ever and we can watch a show. Because that's what you want, right? If I had it my way, I don't enjoy discipline at all. I'd rather not have to do it, but I care for my son's soul and I know it's for his best to do it out of love. But it's not my preferred thing. You know, even in the Old Testament, I found this interesting that God said he takes no delight in the death of the wicked. Like the God of the, as horrible as people are, like the worst of the worst, God, although we may, God said he does not delight in the death of the wicked. He said, wouldn't it rather that they would repent and live? Like that's the heart of God for the worst people in the world. He does not take joy in their death. And I think sometimes, like, we don't view God that way. We think God's like, yeah, get them wicked sinners, you know, crush them. Like hellfire and brimstone, right? Come down and get them. But God's heart is, I don't even, like, he's just and he's righteous. But he's also merciful and compassionate. And he doesn't even take delight in the death of the wicked. And so... I believe even tonight, this is an opportunity to understand that if you've been trying to do it your own way, um, if you've been living in this discord, jealousy, rivalries, divisions, envy, whatever else, God's saying in the humility of drawing near to him, he can pour out grace in your life. He can pour out blessing. He can pour out literally himself so that you get to partake of who he is so that you don't have to wake up grumpy every morning, you don't have to have fits of rage, you don't have to you know, want to chase all these other things because you're literally getting to share in his nature. And from the little bit I've tasted, it's the most calming and settling thing in existence. Right, like if you've experienced the presence of God before truly, whether it's in your own quiet time, on a Sunday morning, maybe driving in the car and just listen, it's, there's a calm over you that to me is better than anything else, right? I got a truck this year. I've wanted a truck for 15 years, right? If you were here last semester, you know the whole story about it. Um, and I'm telling you, that didn't make me a lick happier at all. Like if anything, it made me just more nervous and anxious that something was gonna blow up on it and I was gonna have a really big repair bill, right? Because I bought an old diesel truck and then diesel shot up an extra $2 a gallon right after I bought it, it was awesome. Um, but like, I can promise you from the little bit of like whatever material stuff I've gained, like it does, it ain't, it ain't it. I'm telling you, it ain't it at all. There's, it's, it's almost like a negative satisfaction. But there's a deep peace that comes from God's presence. And he's saying, like, if you draw near to me, and he's saying that because he wants you to. It's not like, well, if you, you know, something like, well, if you drew near to me, I'd draw, you know, I'd draw near to you. But you aren't. Right? I don't think it's that connotation. It's if you draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. I mean, you think of even Pastor Jordan a couple weeks ago talking about like if you're burdened and heavy laden, come to me and I'll give you rest. You can learn from me. I'm gentle. I'm meek. I'm lowly in heart. Like that's God's heart. It's not, it's not I think, oftentimes the lens we read it through. And so he's saying, draw near to me. I'll draw near to you. And then right after that, he says, cleanse your hands you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, weep. Turn your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will exalt you. And then when I was reading that last night and even this morning, the immediate thing that came into my head was in Matthew chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. If you've been in church at all, you've probably heard those before. But the very... First one, as it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And if you read the Beatitudes like promises, right? Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be filled. But that first one, blessed is the poor in spirit, like, it, it means like you're aware of your own spiritual brokenness and that like there is no spiritual hope in your life apart from God. And I believe that's what James is saying right here. He's saying, instead of laughter, grieve more and weep, 
joy to gloom. Humble yourselves. He's saying have, realize that in all your rivalries and your double-mindedness and your fits of anger and all that stuff, like realize I'm spiritually broken and empty. And you humble yourself and you go to God and it says, blessed are those people who are spiritually broke when they humble themselves, right? Before the Lord, he will exalt you. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's like God wants to give you himself. And he's saying in this instance, just in this one promise, there's tons of promises in scripture from how you raise your kids to what they'll end up in life to finances and all this other stuff. But this just one promise. He's saying if you draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. If you realize your own spiritual brokenness and have a humility before God that you're like, man, I'm jacked up, right? Like you can go to God and just be like, I'm mad all the time. I don't, like you can be honest with him. You can be like, I don't love my wife at all, right? Like sometimes I'm just like, you walk in the door. And I'm just like, why are you here? Or your kids, babe, that wasn't you, okay? Because uh, she'll watch these later. I just feel, you know, I feel like I need to put that out there. Um, but like, you know, maybe you have a very broken relationship with your kid. And like, you kind of hate them. They kind of hate you and you don't know what to do about it. Like, you can just go to God and be honest and be like, I can't stand them. I can't stand my kids. I can't stand my wife. I don't like my job. I don't know what to do. This is what I want to do. Like, maybe it's not stuff you would tell other people. You'd be like, I wish my boss would just get hit by a Mack truck, right? Like, if he, if he died in a car accident on the way to work, I wouldn't be mad about it, right? Now, I'm not saying you say that out loud, but I guarantee you some of you boys have probably had thoughts like that before, right? Like, that lives in us. And you can go to God, draw near to him, and just be like, this is who I am. I'm, I'm like spiritually a pauper. I'm a beggar. That's why that word like poor means like nothing to offer. And as you draw near to him, he'll pour himself out to you. And that's just one promise. And so through the promises of God, we get to actually have his nature in us. It's not the old you getting better, which is tiring and doesn't pan out well. It's actually like you get to walk with the Spirit of God in you, and you get to have rivers of living water flow through you, and you get to actually have His nature. I've seen multiple people, almost all of them on staff here, like in the past few years I've been here, have a huge change because of this stuff right here. Like significant. I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it, um, you know, in my mom and everybody else that like, you start to have just like a gentleness and a patience with people that you can't understand. And it's like you can start to see them for who they really are, which is broken just like you. And you get to have a genuinely a heavenly perspective because you're partaking of the very nature of God and you start to see people truly how he sees them. Like they're one of the only eternal things in the universe. God sent his own son to die for them just like he sent his son to die for you. Like, I know we don't often think of people as valuable as we think of ourselves, but like the person you hate, God loves them just as much as he loves you. And as you start to partake of that divine nature, you can start to truly, not fake it, you can start to truly love the people you used to hate because you're starting to have God's divine nature, Him, literally Him and His love in you and flowing through you. It's not you. You've been literally transformed. And so I would encourage you, um, one, this week, maybe just read some of the promises of God and truly meditate on them. But if you're like, maybe confused at like, how do I even draw near to God? If you don't have some type of time for prayer and for reading the Bible, I'm just gonna be honest, you have no shot, right? Like if you got married to your wife but never hung out with her, you didn't really meet her much, you had one encounter, thought she was hot, did the I do's, and then you guys just kind of lived in separate buildings, probably wouldn't know her very well, right? And like, 
you wouldn't be able to predict how she would respond to anything. You wouldn't have any of her nature with you at all. And so if you don't have time where you're truly spending time with the Lord through prayer and through reading the words, like you can't act on God's promises if you don't know them. And it can start very, very small, very, very practical. Like maybe you just read a chapter a day. You can start in the New Testament and just read a chapter and then spend some time praying. I know I talked about this a little bit last semester, um, but just like very practical. Some people like to just pray in their head. It doesn't pan out as well for me sometimes because you're like, you're praying and then you're like, oh yeah, I got to do that today. And then that, and then, oh yeah, we got to do this. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, I haven't prayed in five minutes. I've just been thinking about a bunch of random stuff. Um, but like, I know Pastor Jamie likes to pray usually in his office with worship music and he just prays out loud when nobody's in there. And he said for, the, for him, that helps him focus. And just being honest with God. It's not like you don't need to be eloquent or anything else. You can just be honest with him. For other people, like my mom growing up, she always journaled. So she wasn't praying out loud, but she would have her Bible. She needed complete silence. She didn't like music or anything that distracted her. So she did complete silence and just had like a notebook journal and she read. And that was the way she did it. And one of the cool things about journaling is if you actually write down a prayer and then God answers it later, you have tangible proof that he answered it, which is just cool. Um, and then some people just like to, you know, you can just pray silently and you can focus that way and that's great. Or you like to pray just to worship music. There is no formula. It's whatever works for you. But some type of prayer, some type of reading the truth of who God is. Because like I said last week, you won't get to intimately firsthand know who God is through me or through Jordan or through mom or through any podcast or pastor or anything else. The hope is that God uses this enough to spark to where you actually begin a true relationship with him every day. That's what transforms you. This is like an extra oomph during the middle of the week or on a Sunday morning but you have to get to know God. And it's like, at first, it'll probably be kind of a burden, if I'm being honest. Like, especially if you do it early in the morning, you're not used to it, you'll be like tired, you'll be like, I read the day, I didn't get anything out of it. Like, what does this even mean? You pray a little bit and you might not feel anything, but I promise you, if you stick with it, just like the first day you exercise, you don't got a six pack, right? Right, you look at, you, feel, you may feel it, you did some abs and your abs are cramping, you're like, man, I feel like I look good. And you look in the mirror, you're like, well, nope. Still don't look the same. But if you keep working out over time, there will be a significant change. And it's the same way with scripture. It's slow, it's gradual. But in six months, a year, two years, five years, 10 years, I promise you, if you do this, you'll be a different human. You'll start to actually have peace, joy, love, patience, kindness. All this stuff will actually start to show up in your life, not in a counterfeit way, but you can, like, we can actually have it. I think that's the thing I wanted like, you guys to know tonight, the thing that I felt like the Lord put in my heart was like, if you draw near to him, he'll draw near to you. And like, this isn't unattainable. Partaking of God's nature isn't reserved for people in ministry. It's not reserved for Pastor Jordan. It's not reserved for Terry, because we know she's got love. She loves everybody, right? Um, and it's genuine and it's real. And I never understood it as a kid because the most annoying people came over to the house and mom's like, but God created them and he loves them. Um, but like, it's, it's, God died because he wants you to have it. Like Jesus died, not God. Jesus died on the cross. The son of God died because he wants you to experience his nature. He wants that Holy Spirit with inside of you to build, to do that, to transform you like, he wants to do that in your life. And it's the greatest joy in your life, I promise, being able to do it, even if it starts out kind of like working out and the first day it's miserable and you hurt a little bit the next day, right? But it's not unattainable, and God wants us all to have it. It's not reserved for some special clergy people or people in ministry. It's for all of us.